Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the Capitol will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -huh. Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? The roads. <laughs> you boys like Mexico! I'm as as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! And welcome back. We are live. Taxation is theft. And I have with me tonight Nick Sarwark. How's it going, Nick? It's going great, Daniel. Awesome. So, um... Uh, for those who don't know, Nick is the current Libertarian Party chair um, nationwide. He covers the entire thing. Um, and he's a really awesome guy. He's a lawyer. He's, um, we've, we've talked about some of the tax laws before. Um, and he's very knowledgeable about um, all aspects of libertarianism and all sorts of things. Um, so it's great to have you here. And um, congratulations on your on your recent race. You were just running for mayor in Phoenix. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, our Arizona politics got kind of crazy last year, where um, our senator Jeff Flake decided he wasn't going to run for re-election because Trump hated him. So uh, one of our congresswomen, Kirsten Cinema, decided that she was going to run for Senate which then caused our mayor to decide he was going to run for Congress to take over the Democratic seat that was being vacated, which created a special election. So there was this opportunity where there wasn't an incumbent mayor. There were two incumbent council members, both Democrats who were running. And at the time that I decided to run, there wasn't even a Republican running. Eventually, a Republican got in, but he wasn't you know, the best Republican ever. And it was just an opportunity to go out there, talk about things like, you know, having a balanced city budget where we don't spend more money than the city actually takes in. Uh, and what the city does and what a lot of cities do is they have balanced budgets, but they have bond issues, they have tax overrides, they have, you know, special initiatives to add money in a particular area. So they're never really balancing the budget. They're always borrowing from the future. And as you may know, I have four little kids who would end up footing the bill for all of these stupid projects the city wanted to do. And I just wanted to get the city back to focusing on core services, you know, roads, because libertarians love roads, um, you know, clean water, picking up the trash on time, having public safety respond when you call them uh, in a timely fashion, things, things that people care about, things that everybody agrees about. And we got a lot of traction for that. Um, I think I won every debate I participated in, but I'm a little biased. But I'd have people come up after and say, you know, at every single debate or forum, they'd say, you know, I came in here thinking I was going to support somebody else because I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican or I just didn't know you, and now I've decided to vote for you. And at the end of the uh, vote counting, we got 10%. Uh, it was just over 40,000 votes citywide, uh, which is, you know, everyone tells me is pretty good for a first time out in a four-way race. Absolutely. And so let's let's talk about that for a minute, because I know a lot of people um, are very reluctant to support libertarian campaigns um, just because, oh, you know, I, I mean, especially the bigger campaigns, because, oh, you're never going to win. I'm going to waste my vote. It's going to uh, it's going to create the spoiler where, you know, if if I don't vote for you, then or if I do vote for you, then the person who I really don't want to win is somehow going to win. Um and usually that doesn't even happen. Usually the, the libertarian vote doesn't even cover the gap. I, I mean, obviously we win some, but in in like the bigger elections, like the presidential election, we don't even cover the gap. But in yours, you actually did. And now because of this, they're, they're going to have to have a, a runoff election, right? Right. So um, city races in Phoenix are nonpartisan. So none of us had our party affiliation listed on the ballot, which was huge um, because people then have to decide who do I want to vote for? Now, that didn't mean that people didn't know which party people were in, and the various parties would have slate cards and tell people this is the Republican or this is the Democrat, or in this case, there were two of them. Um, but what it does is if nobody gets a majority over 50% in that first round, they have a runoff election, which is going to happen here in March. 
And the way the vote came out was um, the sort of progressive Democrat, she got 45 percent. The um, kind of mainstream Clinton-esque Democrat, he got 26 percent. Uh, the Republican got 19 and I got 10. So that breakdown meant that the top two would have to advance to a March runoff. So there's going to be a runoff between two former Democratic council members in March. And it's shaken out to be basically, can the progressive Democrat get that last 5% that she didn't get, or will the sort of Clintonian middle of the road Democrat be able to put together everybody who voted for the Republican or the Libertarian? And what's beautiful about that, and so much better than you know a traditional election where it's all resolved that first round, is there's opportunities there for the person who came in second. Because, you know, I had 10% of Phoenicians who voted wanted me to be mayor. Not because, you know, I'm pretty, although I am, but more because they liked the ideas I was talking about. I was the only one talking about cutting spending and actually getting the budget into uh, reality. And so one of the things that is available is either those two candidates who are left can take those ideas and then take those votes. The votes belong to the voter. And that's what I usually respond to when people say you're just a spoiler, is there are people who want libertarian policies. They want more of our policies than they do the other candidates. And if we weren't in the race, they wouldn't have somebody to vote for. So I see our duty as libertarian candidates to be going out there and giving an option and giving a voice to those libertarian voters who are otherwise unrepresented. You know, it's kind of like, even if you don't get elected to represent the whole city, I consider it that it was my duty to represent that 10% who wanted something rational and, you know, a government that focuses only on the things that government should do and not on a bunch of goofy projects and, you know, building light rails and giving money to stadium owners and, you know, property developers and stuff. Right. So, so that's really awesome. So, um, it's, I mean, you created some opportunities there. You, you reached a, a lot of new people who might not have been familiar with um, the party. Um, do, you think, do you think you got some outreach to get some new libertarians um, to support I the do. party this way? I do. Um, you know, somebody did some analysis of the data. About 3,000 libertarian registered voters voted in the Phoenix mayoral election. So even if you assume I got every one of their votes, there's still 37,000, more than 10 times as many non-libertarians that voted for me and saw their first exposure to a libertarian candidate for some of these people was somebody who was making sense who was the the smartest guy on the stage as far as you know his policies make sense and he knows what what's going on that i think is a good first impression that we can then build on in the future if i choose to run for office again or other libertarian candidates here in phoenix they'll have that positive association from the previous run. And that's something I think a lot of our candidates need to remember is you're not the first guy to run for office and you're not the last guy to run for office as a libertarian. And so while you have dividends that have been paid by people who have fought before you for ballot access to even be able to get our name out there, you kind of have a duty to the people who are going to come after you to leave the state of the Libertarian Party and Libertarian candidates in people's minds better than you found it. Awesome. So um, let's talk about this because we we talked earlier this morning um, just to kind of connect and we realized that we're both in places where we don't have daylight savings time. And this is something that it's it's one of these little things where a lot of libertarians feel very strongly about it. and it's one of these things like, where did it come from? Most people are just like, what the hell is this? Why do we have to do this? Damn it. I lost. I, I get one hour less sleep tonight. I have to wake up earlier tomorrow to go to work. Um, but you had some really interesting insights that I never really thought of as far as what daylight savings is. So um, first of all, well, why don't you talk to that a little bit? What, um, what, uh, what you thought about that? Yeah, so um, daylight savings time, like all bad government ideas, uh, came up when we were at a war, uh, specifically World War, I believe it was World War II. And it was this idea that if we 
create this perceived extra daylight in the summertime that's going to help with the war effort and we won't spend so much money on electricity at home and we can go send it overseas to bomb people. It doesn't work. Everybody knows it doesn't work because you aren't really changing when the sun comes up. You're just changing the clock. But like all of those temporary ideas from World War II, things like you know the tax deductibility of health insurance for employers that creates this really broken health care market we have in the United States, it just stuck. And we kept doing it. And it got to the point where daylight savings got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now the most of the country spends more time under daylight savings time than they do under standard time. And the reason for it is a classic example of how small groups who can get a big benefit get government to do things that cost the vast majority of us just a little bit so we won't lobby against it. Um, the big ones for daylight savings and its expansion farther and farther into the fall are the big candy companies and the sugar companies and uh, large property owners that have retail properties, malls and shopping centers and things like that because having more perceived daylight on the clock in October and November gets you both the opportunity for more people to go out after work and go shopping for early Christmas presents or whatever, and it lets kids go out later and trick or treat, which then increases the demand for candy. And it's weird, you get, it's so cheap for a candy company or a group of candy companies to lobby for that, and the Congress people who pass it are like, eh, it's not gonna really hurt anybody. But if you look at the, the analysis, the switch from, you know, standard to daylight savings and daylight savings back to standard kills thousands of people every year. They get into auto accidents. Um, there's lost productivity at work because your throws off your biological clock. You know, people, there, there's a real human cost to it, but you don't see that because it's spread out across the entire country. And I think that the Libertarian Party should take the lead with this and, and actually put that in our platform at the national convention in 2020 that we're just we want to just abolish daylight savings time and stop having the government steal your sleep that's that's awesome uh, and i would totally support that that's actually on my um if you look on my presidential uh campaign page that's one of the one of the issues that's on there um uh along with well here let me ask you this um this is one that um you ask most libertarians and they'll they'll answer it's the first or the second but what is your favorite what's your favorite constitutional amendment oh gosh um <laughs> so so i have one and then i have the runner up all right my favorite is actually the ninth amendment the ninth is my favorite because that's the amendment that says all the stuff we forgot to write down specifically devolves back to the people, and the people have the right to run their life the way they choose, uh, which is why it's the amendment that's most ignored by the courts, and judges hate it, because the idea that there's this default to liberty, where, you know, apple pie and baseball and mom aren't things that are in the Bill of Rights, but I have the right to all of those things because all the rights not otherwise given to the government come back to the people. Um, my backup favorite amendment is uh, probably the fifth, only because I spent five years as a public defender being part, or actually the fifth and the sixth in combination, the, the right to counsel, um, you know, the right to be tried by a jury of your peers, to force the state to prove their burden. You know, I think that's a very, we don't fully appreciate how important that is in keeping this country as free as it is. The, the ability to make the government prove things and make them convince people that live in your community to convict you beyond a reasonable doubt unanimously, combined with the Gideon decision and making sure that if you're you know poor or they seize your assets, you still are entitled to representation when the government tries to lock you in a cage. So you just got like 100 extra libertarian points with me for saying the ninth because that's that one's my favorite <laughs> is it but, really good song? yeah um uh so um and yeah it's one of those things where like i like to bring that up in conversation because you know e even a lot of libertarians they know about the 10th and the ninth and 10th are, are pretty similar um but the 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 10th is more about states rights i guess there's there's individual rights in there but the ninth is just more like hey just because we didn't put it here doesn't mean it's not your right 
Um, so when, it, you know, when anybody says, hey, I have a right to do this, and then one of these status assholes comes along and says, well, where's that in the Constitution? You can say, well, actually, it's right there in the Ninth Amendment. Um, yeah. The 14th <laughs> doesn't get enough shout outs either, um, because the 14th is where you can actually do a lot of the work that the Ninth was supposed to do. You know, the 14th got put in place after the Civil War to make sure that these, you know, newly emancipated slaves weren't able to be hurt by their state governments, you know, by saying, oh, well, it's not the feds. We can just take away your rights. You know, that incorporation of, of those, that floor of, you know, there's, a, there's an amount of rights that everybody is guaranteed just by being a person in this country, that application of the states... I think that's where we're going to get a lot more traction than the ninth because the courts don't like the ninth. Um, so it's doing kind of double duty there. And, and you actually saw it in uh, a recent Supreme Court case, the Tim's case, where state of Indiana took a guy's $45,000 Land Rover as an asset forfeiture seizure for a crime that had a maximum fine of only $10,000. And the justices, especially Gorsuch, were like, this is 2018. Who, who are you saying that the Eighth Amendment doesn't incorporate against the states, that the whole Bill of Rights doesn't incorporate against the states? So I think that's a, that's a different direction to go, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, but I think it will do a lot of the work that the Ninth was supposed to do. Uh, and so it's, it's a good amendment. Interesting. So, so let's hop on back over to, um, to the Fourth for a minute. Um, actually, you said the Fifth. The Fourth and the Fifth are, I think, pretty similar in a different way. Um, but there was a case that, um, I guess it's this, it's this rapper, I guess his name is six, nine or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was recently arrested and you know, it's the, it's the same story you hear with all kinds of drug cases and everything. I don't know exactly what his case was, but apparently he's been talking to the FBI for several months. They've been asking him to do things and not do things. And apparently he wasn't following orders. So they arrested him. He's now sitting in jail waiting trial. Um, but they seized or they froze all of his assets so he can't mm -hmm. hire a lawyer. Um, and I've, I have a couple of friends who I know personally, the same thing has happened to. Um, and this seems like basically a roundabout way of saying, you know, previously they would say, oh, we want to charge this guy and we don't want him to have legal representation. So we'll just throw him into the system, grind him up and spit him out. Now, oh, well, there's this amendment in place that says they they have the right to legal counsel okay fine let's we'll, we'll give them the state appointed legal counsel oh they have money to afford their own good lawyer but we don't want them to have that well let's just take all their money away and then they can't afford that lawyer that seems like what they're doing but it's like oh no this is we're just making sure it's you know it's not drug money and he doesn't find some way to get it out of his bank before he gets set free right and and it is, there have been a couple of cases like that. Um, there's six nines. There was one from a couple of years back where lawyers fight in court over this, that if you say that, that all the money in my bank account came from drugs, if you can prove that, then you can seize it. You can take it back if it's uh, uh, the fruit of a crime. But this idea that you would have a civil forfeiture that would move faster than the criminal case where you can seize the assets before there's actually been a finding of fact in front of a jury and thus take away my ability to defend myself in the jury trial, it's really troubling that, that the government would be able to do that. And my hope is that you know some of this criminal justice reform we're seeing and civil asset forfeiture reform where you know you can we can push back against that. But the government doesn't want things to be hard for it. You know, it's, it's weird. People are always talking about criminal defense attorneys or finding loopholes and, you know, doing dirty tricks to get their clients free on a technicality. Well, that technicality is called the Constitution, um, and it's a very helpful technicality if you're the one who needs it. But the other thing is, you know, the prosecutor's offices are usually better funded than defense attorneys. They have all of the um, resources of law enforcement, either state or federal, you know, detectives and agents and all of that. And uh, judges tend to lean a little bit more towards the prosecution. Juries tend to lean a little bit towards the prosecution and believing the prosecution's case. And so you've already got the deck stacked against you. And then it's the team that, that kind of is cheating still will say, well, it's not fair that you get to actually, you know, put up a real defense. That's not okay. You got to slow your roll. 
And it's very similar to how the two old parties treat the Libertarian Party. You know, we go and say, we want our guys in the debate. We want to be on the ballot. You know, we followed all the rules. We jumped through your hoops. And they're like, no, you know, you have to work even harder. Even though they already have so many advantages, they want to use those advantages to make the field even less fair. And I think that offends a lot of people's sense of, of decency. And that's really what we come back to appealing to, even if we couch it in the Constitution. Really, it's about having our fellow citizens look at this and go, you know, this isn't right. And that, that at a gut level is what will bring us success, I think. Awesome. Definitely. I mean, there's, um, in the, the campaigning and outreach that I've done, I definitely see a lot of people that are, that are coming to this. Um, one thing I noticed earlier on is, a lot of people hear this stuff and they're they're just like they they trust they've been so indoctrinated by the system that they they trust that the justice system just works um and and so like when you tell them all these bad things are going on like you know it's the the first thing they want they want to do in their head is it's like it's denial it's it's no i can't be paying my taxes to a system that does something evil like that there there must have been some other side of the story that you don't know about um, and it's really and there are so many people that are like that until they become a victim of that in one way or another, whether it's, you know, the cop who lied on the ticket um, or, you know, something small or or the cop who patted him down and, and arrested him and, and there were no charges. So they got released. But, um, you know, they're, they're, it always seems like uh, somebody gets kind of punched in the face by the government. And that's kind of when they when they start to turn. Um, for yeah. other people, it's it's taxes, but um, you know they they get a big tax bill and then they're pissed off. Where's my money going? Um, but it, it's it seems like there has to be that kind of a turning point um, for a lot of people. All of these things. So libertarians need to kind of internalize the fact that we are not normal. Generally, uh, libertarians tend to be a lot more rational and logical and. You know, if you can show me the facts, then I'm going to go with it regardless of, you know, what my feelings might be. And what we sometimes don't realize is that most people are not like that. For most people, you have to feel it. And then you'll kind of you'll you'll pick the facts that you need to justify your feeling. And this is how a lot of changes in our society have happened. The reason gay marriage moves so fast through American society was not the legal fight, it wasn't the ballot initiatives, it wasn't the protests. It was people who were affected by this lack of equality before the law talking to their grandmother or their aunt or their parents about who they were and what was happening to them and the people they loved. And being somebody that you recognize as someone that you care about and then you're not getting a fair shake from the government that offended that sense of justice. Similarly, when you get arrested or when you're falsely accused or when you're the one who is facing years in prison for something you didn't do, then it becomes personal and you're able to feel it. And once you feel it, then then it's real for you. You know, we've evolved in, in life to block out a lot of stuff that doesn't matter to us because the only way to stay sane when there's so big of a world with so many people and so much news you have to make it matter to people, and that means it has to be personal. So I think one of the things I've seen that's most effective is telling these stories and telling them in a straight-ahead, objective way. You know, one of the things I think that can most undercut our cause is pushing out some of this sensationalist or fake, you know, kind of blown out of proportion stuff where there really is another side to the story. Because if people find out that you weren't honest with them about what really happened or you over-exaggerated it, then they don't want to believe anything else you say. And I see it sometimes, you know, um, within our movement, some of the more aggressive theoretical um, anarchists will go to the, you know, you trespassed on my property, and because property rights are the best thing of ever, I get to shoot you in the head when you stepped over my fence line. And they, they're like, I, you know derived this rationally from the non-aggression principle and self-ownership and you're like yeah but it's still insane you still just can't shoot people because they walked across your fence line that's not cool at some fundamental level and they're like well you know prove it with logic and it's like 
you know, to to take a phrase from somebody who I'm not a huge fan of and turn it right around, feelings don't care about your facts. <laughs> Like how you feel about that is not going to change when somebody's like, I've got logic. Well, good. Go be over there by yourself with your logic. We don't like you. Right. Um, and I mean, honestly, that's, that's why a lot of, um, that's why a lot of innocent people end up in jail because of this system is, you know, that's, that's how the, that's how the prosecutors tend to, you know, they, they set things up. They, they say, you know, oh, look at this person. He's a criminal. He's, he's done this. They'll, they'll try to bring up the past. Um, and they'll try to make the jury feel like this person is guilty regardless of what the facts say. Um, yeah, it's um, so, you know, to use like a little more progressive kind of social justice rhetoric, there's this whole concept of othering, right? Like by, by using the wrong pronoun or whatever, you've made me other. You made me less than a human or less mm -hmm. than your status in society. I think it gets a little overwrought, especially when we're talking about how we talk to each other online or you know some of these microaggression triggering kind of things. But I'll tell you from practicing criminal defense, that is the key to whether you can win a case or not win a case. If the jury sees your client as somebody that there but for the grace of God could I go, I, if they can see that that's a person like them who has made a couple different choices and now they're in this situation, then they have the ability to find that person not guilty. If they have already categorized that person as not really a person because of their skin color, because of their language, because of you know the terrible thing they've been accused of, then they stop looking at them as people and then there's no chance. You can't get an acquittal no matter what because they're not hearing you. And that empathy for other people, that ability to see the people who are the victims of the drug war or the people who are being you know, tear gassed at the border or people who may have a religion that's totally different from you, to see them as people and not as something else, something other, that's the biggest key to changing hearts and minds. Absolutely. So I'm going to jump around um, quite a bit. I usually do, but... Um... So you just you just mentioned the the border and also you mentioned property rights earlier, um, you know, oh, well, you stepped over my border. So I have the right to shoot you in the head with tear gas. Um, so <laughs> the, the argument is made by a lot of people who say, you know, who they, they want the wall, they want the border. They'll say things like, um, you know, oh, well, would you let these people onto your private property? And they, they kind of equate the entire United States is this giant piece of like thousands of square miles of land um, into your backyard with your little fence around it and your house where you sleep. Um, like while there's like millions of acres of unoccupied land in the U.S., um, you know, and places that are open for rent that these people can actually go and, and you know, uh, pay the landlord's property tax with their rent. Um, paying the taxes and, you know, cause that's, that's the other thing. Oh, they're going to go to school. They're going to, um, they're going to freeload on our system. And it's like, well, yeah, but if they're staying somewhere, they're paying the property tax, which is how the schools are funded. So they're really paying for that. Um, but what, what do you see as like the difference in, um, I guess the, the, um, the property rights of like what property rights does the government actually have when it comes to a huge piece of land like the United States? Like some some king was just basically sitting in a room somewhere with a map and just drew a big circle and said, that's going to be mine. I'm going to call it the United States. Or, you know, someone was like, oh, I'm going to call this one Texas. And then they fought it out with Mexico. And OK, it's Texas oh. now. Um, what's where do these where does that right come from to claim so much land as government property? Yeah, so um, this idea that somehow uh, government land is private property and this libertarian private property theory applies, and that's why we can be restrictionist and still be libertarian, is a garbage idea. Uh, it was first presented in, I think, a speech at the Mises Circle here in Phoenix, of all places, which is ironic because we live close to a border. And it it's broken on a lot of different levels, so I'll kind of talk about this for as long as you'll let me because right. there's so many layers of this onion first one is this you don't own the whole country 
If you owned the whole country, then yes, you could be like, don't come into my country. But it's held by the government in uh, this concept of usufruct, you know, like natural resources or large tracts of land should be held for the benefit of everybody. That's the kind of property law concept that's going on there. And so there is an argument that it would be better for everybody if we didn't let people come into our country. That's that's the traditional argument. But libertarians can't really adopt that argument because then that says the government has rights, which we're like, the government doesn't have rights. Governments don't get rights unless we grant them a way to them, right? So the other thing that, that this argument ignores completely is, yeah, you may not want to let somebody into your yard or inside your fence line or into your house, but you can't stand in the middle of my street and stop somebody from coming to my car dealership or coming to my house to buy something that I put on offer up, right? At that point, you're interfering with my property rights and my right of free association to be able to trade with, to enter relationships with, to employ people as I choose as long as it's voluntary. So you're, you're interfering with one right because you think you're protecting another one. The other thing is, once you start going down that path of, these people are not net taxpayers, then you're saying it is valid for the government to take away rights from people because they don't pay enough into the government. At which point, you don't wanna go there. That's a bad, bad place to go. That goes back to the franchise can only be had by people who own land. That goes back to you know men get to vote and women don't. That goes back to three-fifths of the person. It goes to a bad place. The other thing, the other place it goes, and, and you can ask this question of somebody, is what, what is the fundamental difference between somebody who's born in, in Texas and doesn't have a job and has a bunch of kids and gets food stamps and welfare and all these other things that are basically freeloading on our economy and someone who was born in Hermosillo who has, you know, comes to Texas, has a job, doesn't have a job, doesn't have a kid, food stamps, all the other stuff, right? What's the fundamental difference because of where they're born? And then you get into really weird stuff about, you know, where you're born magically gives you more rights than other people that weren't born in that same place. And that's not libertarian. There's a philosophical theory about, you know, nationalism and this idea that people from one place are better than people from other places. But it goes to a place that I don't think most libertarians really want to go if you follow it to its conclusion. Libertarianism is a fundamentally individualist non-country-based philosophy. We believe in the rights of individuals to own themselves and trade peacefully with other individuals, regardless of jurisdictional lines. Borders establish who's in charge on one side or the other, but they don't have to be walls. There's no walls between Arizona and California or you know, Arizona and Utah or Arizona and New Mexico, as much as I think that we might wanna keep some of those people out. They get to drive back and forth on the highway, but it's still, you know, if they drive too fast on this side of the line, then they go to an Arizona court, and if it's on the other side of the line, they go to a New Mexico court. That's what borders are good for. They establish who's in charge where I'm at, and there may be rules about where you're at, about who gets to apply for benefits, who gets to do things. That's fine, too, but this idea that you can take away somebody's individual right to trade peacefully with other people because they have the wrong culture, they have the wrong skin tone, or their parents happen to be born in the wrong place is fundamentally racist and bigoted, and it has no place in libertarian philosophy. Which is not to say, and I wanna, you know, because this will probably cause a lot of controversy, that's not to say that people who believe in restrictionism or the wall or some sort of tight immigration control shouldn't be part of the Libertarian Party, shouldn't be libertarian, shouldn't vote for libertarians. We've all got stuff that we believe that may not be completely rational or may not line up 100% with some philosophical template of the perfect libertarian. That's okay, but we need to have an open discussion about some ideas that can be really harmful and damaging if taken to their conclusion and are not beneficial for our economy. The ironic thing is we have a fundamentally dynamic labor market in the United States that requires new people to keep coming here at a rate that's higher than they have been lately in order to keep the system going. 
the the irony is if you really care about the welfare state and you want to make sure that social security is there for people and that we are able to have a social safety net you kind of have to have a bunch of able-bodied immigrants keep coming because otherwise the pyramid scheme doesn't work so the irony is that all these older americans who are like you know get your hands off my medicare and you know legals are taking our jobs kind of thing are fundamentally undercutting the ability for the government to backstop them when they get old because they're not letting new people into the system. It, they're, they're killing the goose that lays the golden eggs, and they don't even realize it. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a really interesting point, too. And this goes back to, like, the, the emotional, um, you know, it's we, – we all have this um, – we all have this understanding, right? In general, pretty much everyone understands it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to kill, um, mm -hmm. it, it's wrong to, you know, basically hurt other people. But that all goes away when it's when it's for your own survival, right? When you're afraid, when you're in fear for your own survival, if somebody's breaking into your house, you'll kill them. And it's it's understandable. It's not murder. It's it's defense now, right? right. Um, and then we get into like more of a gray area where if somebody, you know, somebody stole some food because they were starving and there was there were no jobs and there's no other way, then it's kind of like, eh, okay, we'll let it slide because they, they were just stealing food to feed their family. A lot of people are kind of like, okay, well, they, they shouldn't spend 50 years in prison for that. Um, and, and then you kind of get down this slippery slope into this gray area of, of all these different possibilities. And now it becomes not, you know, not an immediate um, survival need like I need to feed my family right now but more of like a a, um, a, a kind of future um, indefinite uh, in concrete possibility of some potential threat to to your survival where oh if somebody comes here they're gonna they're gonna take my job and and my life's gonna go to shit and I'm gonna I'm gonna fall on dire times and I'm not gonna have any money to feed my family and my social security's gonna be gone I'm not gonna be able to retire I'm gonna die young all, all these other fears that are put into people's heads and so now these fears now justify it, it, it kind of like puts them on that survival thing like I gotta survive I gotta keep these people out I gotta do this I gotta take the guns away from these people I gotta I gotta you know we gotta right. get rid of the gays all these things that are like now they're not hurting these people they're protecting their own survival in their head that's that's well, or in their and, emotions and that's the thing i mean one there's also that element that i talked about before where you know you only shoot a guy who comes into your house if they're actually in your house in the dark you know you don't just shoot somebody but if it's an animal you might shoot them in another circumstance where you'd never shoot a person and then if you start kind of treating certain groups of people as less than people then you start doing some bad things that you wouldn't otherwise do. But the other piece of it is we do really need to talk to the fear. You have to talk to the fear first. You can't give them, you know, the economic argument of supply and demand and dynamic labor markets, which is why, you know, one of the things I pointed out the other day, because somebody made an argument that, you know, we have some sort of self-defense against people who would come here and take welfare, which takes my tax money and uses it on their kids or whatever. Um, which is a just let's even let's even eat that premise right let's eat that fear yes there's a person that's going to come and take welfare and that's going to be paid for with your tax money here's the real talk if you build a wall and you stop those people from coming government's still taking your tax money there'll be no refunds when they build the wall there'll be no refunds when you drug test people for getting food stamps there'll be no refunds when you know you say you have to be a net taxpayer to to get any sort of services there's not they're not giving back any of the money they take from you just because you were cruel to somebody else and so yes the fear that you may not have a good future or that you may not be able to find a job in a tough market or that they'll create this competition it's a real and valid fear but the solution that's being offered of trying to create restriction and stop people from coming here to seek a better life for their children won't allay the thing you're afraid of. And that's the first step. You have to talk to the fear first. Then you can sort of pivot to if we welcome people to come here, we're automatically getting the cream of the crop from whatever other country because they had to take the time to come here from their country at great personal expense and sometimes at danger. 
they're automatically like hard chargers because they're coming here oftentimes not even speaking our language. You know, we've been able to select out the people who have the most drive and ambition from these other countries because they come here. That's why they come here. The other piece of it is, you know, once they come here, especially if they come as able-bodied young men, which they often do, especially in a more open immigration system, then they actually have less children and older family members here that would need to be supported. So they're, they're less likely to take those tax benefits. And it's going to build up the economy. They're going to do the jobs that make our lives easier. And that's one of the things that really frustrates me about like a Bernie Sanders immigration policy or the Trump administration was actually looking at the same thing where we want people to show that they have a, a good degree and, you know, they have a lot of money and they're super skilled and they, you know, they have they're able to work in high tech or whatever. And you look at that and you're like, holy crap, this guy wants to protect American jobs, but only the really shitty ones. <laughs> Like he wants to That's protect picking things out of fields and assembling things in a factory and cleaning up hotel rooms, but he wants to give away all the really high paying jobs to immigrants. Well, like, even if you're a, a populist, that's insane, right? Don't come take our crappy jobs. Only we want the people from other countries that'll take the really good ones. I, I think that's still um, I, I mean that makes sense in the as far I mean it doesn't make sense as a policy but it makes sense as you know the the sales pitch for that because um, I mean I work in tech I know there's I know there's um, you know people who work in medicine there are a lot of doctors and nurses who come from overseas um, because they're very well trained and they can make a lot more money here um, those are those are typically jobs that are uh, i mean i know in my market they're always looking to hire people there aren't enough people to fill these jobs so it kind of makes sense that like okay yeah we need to fill these nobody's afraid of losing their job because there's just so many of them so right. but but at the same time now you have like factories that are being shut down um or factories that are switching like they have to lay people off because they're switching to automation everything's done robotically now so now right. people who are in that factory worker class it's, it's not necessarily immigrants that are taking their job. There are all these other factors, but the reality is it's just a job. I mean, the, the, we need to evolve and say, okay, um, so the factory jobs are gone. Let's find something else. There's plenty of other shit to do, but I, I think it's really interesting that, you know, it's, it's like, you know, what, what if the, uh, the horse and buggy company, like whenever, when the cars came out and everyone started getting cars, like, what if the horse and buggy people got together and said, no, we can't have immigrants because they're going to take the horse and buggy jobs. But it's really like, wait a minute, those jobs are kind of going away anyway. Right. So um, um, this is the irony of the free market. Uh, and it's something that we need to recognize as libertarians to be able to, to talk to the, the fear again. Um, a dynamic labor economy and a free market produces overwhelming prosperity across the board. But the creative dis destruction talked about by Schumpeter, where you know certain jobs go away and other jobs pop up, and some industries rise and some industries fall, and innovation creates completely new things we wouldn't see, is very disruptive to the lives of the people who had the previous job. So part of it is you can use the horse and buggy example, or you can use the, the assembly line guy at the GM plant example as a macro example. But if you don't have an answer for the factory guy who's losing his job or the horse and buggy guy who has kids to feed, then you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to be able to put together a coalition in order to, to show people the better way. You have to have an answer for that. And that's, again, where it comes back to telling stories. It comes back to listening to people about what their personal concerns are and showing them a better free market solution that actually addresses their concern about not having something to do to feed their kids. That's, you know, for all the, the idea that I'm not trying to make any new government programs, you know, the most successful things that I've seen for um, displacement are things like buyouts when a factory closes or job retraining programs, either funded by the government or funded by the company that's going to get rid of the factory because you need to give people an opportunity to keep moving forward in their lives 
if you're going to take something away from them that that's going to really disrupt their life. And it's just good business. You know, um, one of the things that Henry Ford famously said <laughs> is, uh, you know, I think he said something like cars can't buy cars <laughs> when he when he raised the minimum wage in his factory to twice the prevailing wage. If he doesn't have factory workers that can afford to buy cars, he can't make as many cars. And that that pressure is something that I think people don't talk about enough when we talk about free markets is if you're providing goods or services into the market, you need to have customers. And so you can't underpay your workers to the point that they can't shop in your store. Um, you know, the Chinese sort of get away with it because if people are um, imprisoned or otherwise caged, then you don't really care if, if they're not going to be your customers. But even they've had to create uh, domestic markets because they can't maintain the same growth level that they need in order to maintain an authoritarian society without developing domestic markets. And so, you know, markets have safety valves. And this was something, you know, look at, for example, the marijuana market in Colorado. When Amendment 64 passed, one of the most brilliant pieces of that legislation, that initiative, was the six plant home grow allowance in the law. Because what it did was it made sure that even if there was an excise tax, even if, you know, everything went commercial in the cannabis market, if the prices got out of control or the taxes got too high, people would just become really good gardeners in their own house. And it's it's a safety valve. And so that's one of the reasons why it's so important to protect the freedom of markets to kind of let players rise and fall, because the market will settle itself out to a level as long as you don't create these distortions that stops it from settling. You know, when we had uh, the Bracero program or when we had a more open entry visa for the southern border, people would come here if we needed a bunch of agricultural or labor work. And as soon as the economy contracted and we didn't need them, they'd go back home to Mexico. But when you have to pay $10,000 to a coyote to get across the border, even if the job market goes to hell, you can't go back because you can't afford the ten grand to get back again. So you stay here, further depressing wages, making the recession last longer, rather than being able to go back and forth and, and let the economy find its level and let it recover. Um, you know, a lot of things in life, the more you try and control something, the less likely it is you're going to get the outcome you want. So, um, th and that's that's another great logical argument that most people aren't going to hear, but... Um, <laughs> But so so I'm going to go back because um, I, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they asked me a great question, which is, you know, what happens when when automation gets so well advanced that we don't need there are zero employees. There's just the, the factory owners who are basically providing all of our food, all of our cars, all of our electronics, everything. It's just the, it's just like, you know, a handful of maybe 10,000 people and then the rest of the seven billion people in the world have no jobs. And my my answer to that or my my presumption i would have to say because nobody knows the future would be that um you know if if uh, if a handful of people if there's ten thousand people on the entire planet and they're they're producing all of the world's food and nobody has a job and nobody has any money who are they going to sell it to and that's really like the the car example you were saying it's like, yeah, you can automate all of it, but either either it's, that's going to drive the price down to like nothing so that, you know, however you buy it, it's it's not even an issue. Or people are just going to say, well, hey, that's too expensive. I don't have a job. I don't have any money. I'm just going to start growing the stuff in my own backyard. Yeah. So uh, it's actually I've been thinking of uh, a book draft about this very thing where, you know, our society has evolved to the point where we're not quite in the Star Trek post scarcity economy where I can just you know, have something pop out whenever I want it without any need for money or a means of exchange. But we've moved much farther along on that path than I think most people realize. And when you do that, when you have this surplus of production, you have the ability to produce things at a very low cost where you don't have to actually work that much to be able to have a roof over your head, eat healthy food, wear clothes, you know, and kind of live. There's two directions societies can go when they have that kind of abundance. We can either, you know, make beautiful things for entertainment and literature and art and music and video games and all this other stuff 
and, and innovate new products that meet new demands that we didn't even know existed, or we can kill each other until there's you know fewer people and then things get back to their level. Um, and historically, that's how economies have, have, they either contract through war or some sort of disease, or they expand. Um, but you have to move one way or the other because human societies are dynamic societies. And so I think when you get a small number of producers are able to be very efficient and produce all of whatever the commodity is that we need for the entire society at a low cost, then the other people do different stuff. You know, we, we've evolved to the point we used to be very labor intensive in this country. We used to have domestic servants, uh, not as many because of, you know, America has its own psychological things that come from us leaving uh, England and, and Europe. But compared to India, compared to Mexico, you know, in India and Mexico, stuff is expensive, but labor is cheap. In America, labor is expensive, but stuff is cheap, especially automated stuff. And, you know, the market will adapt to where you live in the world. But I would rather to try and get Mexico and India and China to the point where labor is not so cheap anymore to where stuff is cheap so that those people can then pursue other things with their lives if they so choose, where it's not so much going, you know, and, and having three or four servants in a normal household because you're trying to give those people things to do, uh, you know, it, Economics, fundamentally, the, the biggest thing that I ever took away from economics is the idea that you can do anything, but you can't do everything because you have limited time and money. And if we look at that in the macro scale, our society, all of us together, can do anything, but we can't do all the things. So that's where you need leadership. That's where you need people to kind of evangelize some of these ideas and point people towards making beautiful things and new and innovative things instead of pointing people towards who are the people we hate and how are we going to kill them. And, and I think that's really important. Like if we look at like some of the, uh, you know, with, well, we, we say like the biggest advancements in historical technology, like, like discovery of electricity um, or invention of the telephone, the radio, which, you know, those are like nothing now compared to what we're, what we're doing. But if we look at those, a lot of those like those were not created or, or discovered or invented by people who were, you know, working for for big corporations like GE, who basically had, you know, some some boss telling them go invent something. This was this was people who basically, you know, they didn't have a lot to do. And these were the things that they did with their spare time. So we're kind of like in this, you know, um, in this mindset now where we're like, oh, well, we got to work 40 hours a week. That's a, that's a normal job and it's like it's tiring it's exhausting do we really want to work this hard um and and you know if we do start shifting towards that where we're working less and you know the i mean if, if you look at like the cost of of things right like the cost of owning a house the amount of labor required to actually build a house and live in it is really not as much as we put into our jobs to get money to put into the house it's it's really not mm -hmm. Um, if you were if you were to instead of working for your job, say, I'm going to go build my house, you could build your house in less hours than it's going to take you to work at your job to build that house. Um, but it's not going to look that pretty because you're not an expert and you don't have all that experience. So you'd rather work and hire somebody else and pay them to do it. Um, but the reality is that's that's like a it's a it's a psychological control control structure on us, because the reality is. We don't have to do this. Now, of course, we kind of have to because government says we have to and you can only hire, you know, licensed workmen and, and electricians and all that. But um, but the reality is, if we if we get to some point in the future, it's not like people are going to be homeless because they don't have the money to buy a house. There's always a way to I mean, when when human beings were created, we were all homeless um, mm -hmm. and nobody complained about it. They were just like, oh, let me let me let me make a hut. Let me pick some sticks and make a tent or, or a shelter or something out of it. Let me find a cave. Um, nobody complained really like all these, all these complaints that we have about, about not having things being, being poor, like not having a car is considered poor. It's like, well, shit, a hundred years ago, nobody had a car. Um, it, it's so, yeah, go ahead. So I think that the insight you're looking for here 
the most important or valuable commodity in modern society is not gold it's not bitcoin it's not money it's it's not even capital or land or guns or any of that the most valuable commodity is attention it's human attention it's it's getting somebody's attention for a moment that's the most valuable thing you can have and even if you go back and you look at the innovations that were created by you know large corporations like xerox or um, ibm they were done at places like bell labs or places like um, park out in california where you would have scientists who would noodle around on projects and put tons of hours into like coming up with cool ideas and then the company would try and figure out how to make that cool idea into something that made money but the thought process that was required to get to that innovation was having smart people apply all of their attention to these cool ideas for a sustained period of time and uh, Cal Newport just um, put out a book called Deep Work uh, there's a book review on my blog I'll send you a link if you want um, talking about how society we have today is designed to take that attention and feed it into engines of distraction things like Facebook and Twitter and email and you know smartphones they're all designed to take our attention away in tiny little bits to make sure that anytime we're distracted anytime we're standing in line anytime we're sitting down we're looking at our phone we're playing Pokemon we're getting on Facebook we're finding out fighting with somebody on Twitter and what they're taking away from us is that ability to focus for long periods of time on big ideas or big projects or things that you want to do to change the world where the application of four hours in a row of thinking about a problem is better than 400 hours that are broken up into little fragments when you're constantly being interrupted by email and the phone call and the Facebook game and all that other stuff. That attention is key to you know moving our society forward and if if we want to you know come up with these big things we need to focus on them and actually focus on what we're trying to do and not let ourselves get distracted and we need to understand that the people who want to make money look at this the same way that you would design a video game you know one of the things that happens in video games is people get too much of whatever the in-game currency is so you need a money sink you need something for them to buy that's then destroyed so that then they have to go get more money. They can't be comfortable, because if they're comfortable, then they stop playing. That's, you know, that's a function that right now in our society is filled by student loan debt, which is vastly overinflated, um, health care costs, which are vastly overinflated. Uh, and if you notice, most of these things are heavily regulated by the government, which then adds extra cost of regulation and regulation compliance on top of the natural cost, so that these become the money sinks that make us work longer hours even though we don't need to work the long hours for transportation and shelter and food. Now we have to work the longer hours to pay for the stupid degree I got with the federally backed loan that can't be discharged in bankruptcy. Or we need longer hours to pay for the $300 tube of cream for my eye because I scratched my eye today even though the tube of cream costs like two cents to, to make. You know that That kind of stuff is designed to keep us having to work in not always fulfilling endeavors to keep this engine going. And, and I think there's a way for us to be good social critics as libertarians of you know, meaningless things that are created by people with large corporations without getting to the level of a progressive where you'd say, well, well now we need the government to make it illegal to do stuff like that. I think we can just persuade people that that's not the most fulfilling way to live your life rather than having to try and pass a law. Definitely. So um, I, I want to ask you, I want to move on to a really serious question. Um, what's your position on legalizing pineapple pizza? I think it should be legal to make all kinds of bad choices in your own life. So but people should not be able to force other people to eat pineapple pizza. That would be a violation of libertarian principles. All right. Fair enough. So somebody somebody told me that you were not a fan of the pineapple pizza. So I had to ask. Um, that is that is another one of my um, campaign issues right there. So <laughs> we got the here. We got the legalized pineapple pizza stickers. As we should. It should um, be legal. 
much like drinking a bottle of Windex from under your sink. I think that it's Absolutely. a bad idea. <laughs> it it'd probably make you sick, but you know, knock yourself out. Um, so, um, I'm trying to think if I have any other questions for you. I know, um, I, I was on the call last night and I heard a lot of people asking it, kind of the same. So, so I stumbled on the libertarian party, um, maybe five years ago now. And after going through, I, I, I went, I ran my first race um, and I kind of saw what was going on and, and this brought up one of my concerns and I heard a lot of the same question on the call last night, which was people kind of struggling with how do we get these ideas out there? Because it seems like we're, we're really fighting really hard, but for some reason, and we are making, we are making pretty massive strides compared to the size of, of the people who are supporting this. But it it seems like a lot of people are still kind of disenchanted with like, we're we're never going to do this. It's, it's too big. It's too big of a, you know, there has to be like a magic pill. Like we have to, we have to come up with like some, some, like a, a class or a marketing campaign or a, or branding or something um, that's going to get us over this hump and like turn us into like you know this thing where like a hundred million two hundred million Americans are going to come to us next month. Well, there is a strategy for that. I mean, there is, but you need you need a disruption to be able to take advantage of it. Um, the last time that we had a great shift like that was uh, the Republicans displacing the Whigs. And it required the Whigs to ignore a very core social issue that a lot of people felt passionately about. And they thought they could just, you know, kind of punt and compromise and avoid talking about slavery at all. The Republicans said, hey, there's this market gap where this other party isn't talking about this issue that is morally, you know, very in, um, it's energizing for people and people care about it. So they found that gap. And it didn't a lot of the republicans when they took over the whigs and and became displaced them as the second party in the country it was a lot of defections it was a lot of people switching in a block because once you get that catalyst you get enough people kind of where people see the momentum and how it's shifting then everybody runs to jump all at once the problem with that is you can't call that shot ahead of time All you can do is try and find the issues that the other parties are ignoring that are of deep concern to a a sizable chunk of the electorate. And then you have to speak to those issues that they're passionate about so that they know that you're a solid advocate for their issue. And you get bigger and bigger vote totals. You get more and more support. And you keep chipping away. Part of the thing that's important to being a libertarian for a long time, and I'm pushing on 20 years as an adult uh, involved in the party, is um, you got to try really hard on this stuff. We have to fight harder than everyone else has to fight, but you have to not fight too hard. Don't kill yourself. Don't kill yourself in this election or the next election. Don't burn yourself out. Don't get divorced. Don't lose your friends and family. You know, you want to push, but you want to recognize that you need to have something left to keep going, you know, to go back to your kids, to be able to gear up for the next race. You know, one of the things we we did really good in the Phoenix race, I think. Uh, I raised a, about one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, so roughly enough to start a startup business in this campaign. And we ran it for a year with a full time campaign manager and a dedicated office and all sorts of stuff. We ran a very professional, very good campaign. We got a lot of compliments from our opponents that were better funded, but they spent you know one point three, one point five million dollars in the same race, and you have to recognize the field you're, you're fighting on. I'm not going to be able to raise $1.5 million. That's not doable. So you have to decide, how am I going to play my game and not get too much into their head and not fight on their ground, but make them come to fight on mine? This is guerrilla warfare. This is asymmetric warfare if it's done properly. And if you do that, you can, one, have a lot of fun, Two, end up coming out of every election with a slightly bigger team and a slightly bigger bench and a little just little more, you know, gumption. 
And, and three, you can really piss a lot of status off by just making them fight on your ground and have to talk about issues they don't want to talk about. And then, you know, worst case scenario, in order to get the votes to win the race, they legalize, you know, cannabis or they balance their budget or they get rid of the deficit. And you're like, hey, I got something done and I don't even have to have a crappy government job. Look at me. I'm a winner. Nice. Um, all right. I got one more question um, relevant to uh, uh, some current events um, in France. There are some riots going on over a new tax that they've got. Um, and th I see I see a lot of tension. I see a lot of talk. Um, Americans are always like, yeah, we need to start rioting. Um, nobody ever does, of course, unless it's like the people who are just like rioting over nonsense and throwing right. bricks into Starbucks, which is like, you know, they're mad at the police and then they go attack Starbucks. It's like, how's that helping? Um, but at the same time, it seems like everybody is afraid to protest. Like in the, like you had the freedom riders, um, you know, back in the, in what, in the sixties who basically said, we're going to go down to the city and we're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to violate all their Jim Crow laws and we're going to get arrested and we're happy to do it because we're protesting and we're standing up for something. But now – and this kind of goes back into maybe your, your – you know, keeping everybody occupied with like these, these micro tasks. Um, you know, like everyone's afraid, well, if I get arrested for, for protesting, then I'm, I'm going to lose my job or, you know, all these – it's going to disrupt my life in some way. How is it that the French are still able to do that and – we're just basically all talk about it. And then, you know, if they come for my guns, we'll riot. But then they came for your guns and you still didn't riot. Um, um, they killed a bunch of people the last go around. And so the French government, I mean, I, what are you on, the Fourth or the Fifth Republic? Like the French have a history of just upending their entire governments and either throwing people in jail or cutting off their heads when they, they feel like government's gone a little too far. And it creates a real fear. It's, it's ironic because we think we're Americans. You know, our government's afraid of us. The individuals, the sacrosanct here in the land of the free and the home of the brave. But the French scare their government way more than the Americans scare ours. There is still the opportunity, though, for, for public protest to do good things. And what it does, you have to, you have to do the asymmetric warfare, right? You have to find the place where there's a pressure point um, governments don't like ridicule very much, and there's a lot of non-compliance. There's a good short story by Melville uh, called Bartleby the Scrivener, which if you've never read, it's it's in the public domain. You'll be able to find it. It's worth your read tonight right. um, about how you can resist something you don't want in a way that's completely polite, nonviolent, doesn't get you in trouble but drives the other side so mad that they just give you what you want because you're you're just annoying. Like, you annoy them into compliance. And that's basically, you know, that's what the protest movement in in France did. That's, that's what mass strikes did. I mean, if you look at um, public education, for example, the Red for Ed movement this last year made some huge strides because you put 50,000 people out on the streets of Phoenix all in red T-shirts... The governor's like, those people vote. I want to be governor again. I'm going to do something about this. You know, you get all of the public school teachers to strike at once. That screws up a lot of people's lives because, you know, we build our lives around schedules. And that means that my schedule doesn't work because my kids aren't at the place that they're normally supposed to be. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, creates pain. The best example that I love uh, it's a few years back, but you remember Indiana passed a law that said that you could discriminate against gay people if you had a religious you know, view that you could discriminate against gay people. They passed that law, and it took you know, months and months to get it passed. It took about a week of Salesforce and the NCAA and a bunch of people saying, we're just not coming to Indiana anymore. We're boycotting. We're moving our headquarters. We're not having a championship. We're not bringing you any money. We're not spending any money in the state. You guys, you know, have your stupid bigoted law. We're not interested. And like within a week, they had a special session and repealed it. <laughs> people wow. were able to make a movement that government couldn't do because people really do have the power. And the distractions are a way to try and keep us away from knowing that we have the power. But, you know, 
it, it's everything from little things to big things. You know, go run for office, but also tip in cash and don't write it on the credit card receipt. Is the IRS still going to try and take that server's, you know, chunk of tips as taxes? They'll try, but why make it easy, right? Fly in the United States and you have to go through the airport, but opt out for the pat down from TSA every time. Is it still a Fourth Amendment violation? Yeah, but then I made somebody actually do work. Like you have to do work to violate my rights. And, you know, I get to the airport an extra 10 minutes early. It all works out. But you make them feel the pain of doing the job that they have. Uh, you know, um, another good, all my examples are from literature. I used to have time to read. Um, <laughs> Neil Stevenson's novel, Cryptonomicon, if, if, I don't know if you've read it. No. But there's, a, there's an enlisted man, a, a sergeant, and he talks about the most frightening thing that you can do to break a lieutenant is follow every order to the letter immediately without question. Because most lieutenants don't know what they're doing and they will screw up and you have you take away all of their safety net when you don't resist at all, when you're entirely compliant. You know, and th that's the thing. When whenever you take something to a radical extreme, you can create effects that you didn't think were possible. You know, like when Gandhi or, or Martin Luther King take nonviolence to a radical extreme, you know, when, when Cambodians light themselves on fire in the street, it changes stuff because you don't expect people to be that intense about it. There's, there's all sorts of ways that we can change the world, and we probably don't have enough time to cover all of them tonight. But, all you right. know, this is one of them too, isn't it? Yeah. Um, awesome. Okay, well um... – we are at about time for tonight, but um, are there any websites you want to plug? Any Facebook, Twitter, websites, anything? Yeah, so um, if people want to follow more about what I'm doing or saying or being all about, Facebook slash NSARWARC, uh, Twitter slash NSARWARC, um, Instagram slash NSARWARC. It helps to have a pretty uh, unique last name. Um, I'm pretty open and accessible and, and try and make my views known. Um, People should really join the Libertarian Party. Uh, visit lp.org slash join. We need your money. We need your support. We need you to stand up and be counted. I know a lot of people don't want to join things, and I get it. You know, I'm part of that generation where we stop being joiners. But solidarity is the thing that makes the French government get rid of their tax, you know, that they tried to implement. Solidarity is the thing that, like, overthrew the Polish communist government. Solidarity is the thing that can change America. So, you know, if you are an independent or an anarchist or little L libertarian, stand up and be counted with the rest of us so that we can go out there and kind of swing around that power of standing together, but use it to take government power instead of it to take away people's rights. Awesome. And uh, when you're done going there to join and, and checking out those other pages, go to taxationstheft.cards, get your T-shirts, get your hats. Get your get your big taxation and theft flag, um, and all your cool stuff. And um, Nick, it was great talking with you, and we'll we'll have you on again soon. I I look forward to seeing you in Austin, 2020. If I don't see you before then, and hey, keep Austin weirder. It, definitely. I I don't know how much weirder it can get, but we're gonna try. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna see. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks again, and taxation and theft, and I'll see you around. Thank you. Taxation is theft. Please, at least leave us alone in our living room. My job is to find the truth. Double the taxes. I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. Triple the taxes. This is an IRS agent's dream. If you think that the capital will ever treat us fairly, you are lying to yourself. Beautiful, lovely taxes. Uh -oh. <laughs> Sorry, but I don't do taxes. Did you see the memo about this? The government is a greedy piglet. Just leave us alone. Do you know what Ralph just said? The roads. <laughs> you boys like Mexico! Oh!